Coliseum's Expo Center, where hundreds of unaccompanied migrant children are staying. Coming up, details on their visit. Air Life transporting a patient after a big rig accident shuts down I-35 and knocks down live power lines over railroad tracks. We have crews there on the scene with the very latest. And coronavirus cases rising across the country has top health officials worried that some are declaring victory too soon. This is more states are opening up the COVID-19 vaccine to all adults. Next. If you're a homeowner, new property appraisals are coming out later this week. And for most people, those values are going up despite a pandemic. Get ready for a cold front that's going to greet us tomorrow morning. Big changes behind that front. I'm going to tell you all about it and talk about rain chances coming up in a few minutes. The news at five starts right now. And first at five, a semi truck with its bed up, ripping down overhead wires across I-35, causing a fire and backing up traffic there for hours it, this afternoon. Yeah, this happening along I-35 North near Eisenhower Road a little before one this afternoon. Garrett Berger is at the scene live right now. Garrett, how do things look on the roadways there and was anybody hurt? Right, well, the main lanes, as you can see behind me, don't have the wires across them anymore. These were down across the access roads and the wires. From what we can see, traffic starting to pick back up here on the northbound side, at least, and it appears so that uh, over on the southbound, things are pretty, uh, pretty much back to normal as well. Not sure about that access road. Now, San Antonio police say that the driver of this big rig dump truck was heading north on the highway when the bed's hydraulics engaged without the driver realizing it. That raised bed snagged on overhead lines, causing the driver to crash and drag the lines down, causing a mess for about 15 other cars on the road, too, that were hit by debris or cables. I just happened to see the 18-wheeler with its bed up, and next thing you know, there was explosions and wires all over the place, and I got caught up in the majority of all the wiring and uh, stuck in the vehicle for about half hour. Police say a 31-year-old woman in the truck was airlifted with possible head injuries. The 45-year-old male driver was transported by ambulance. Now, the downed wires even caused a small brush fire near a building on the other side of the highway. However, from talking with the fire department, it's not clear if the building itself ever caught on fire. And you can see that there are still crews out here fixing the downed wires from different communications companies and also CPS Energy. We just heard from police a few minutes ago telling us that they're now estimating the damage for just the downed wires at about one and a half million dollars. Not a great day for that truck driver. Live on the northeast side, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Mm, all right, thanks, Garrett. Happening right now, the first group of unaccompanied minors arriving from the border are getting situated at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Hall. The group, 500 teenage boys, arrived here last night where they'll be temporarily housed till they're hopefully reunited with sponsors or with family members. A tour of that facility just wrapped up a few moments ago. Congressman Joaquin Castro, Mayor Ron Nirenberg, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, and County Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores all getting a first hand look at what it's like inside. Our Tiffany Huertas joins us live from outside Freeman Coliseum near that expo hall with more details on today's visit. Tiffany. Myra, Steve, from what officials tell us, they say that the kids are being treated well here. There's even a space for them to play soccer. Another thing they mentioned, officials say that there's been an outpouring of support from volunteers to donations. Now, these children arrived to this facility late Monday night. HHS says the facility provides shelter for 13 to 17 year old children. The department says the site is providing sleeping quarters, meals, recreational activities and medical services. The facility has a potential capacity of more than 2,100 beds. Congressman Joaquin Castro of San Antonio visited the shelter and says still more needs to be done. I was at Carrizo Springs uh, last week and we discussed recommendations for really uh, reimagining and redoing actually how we how we handle people who present themselves at the border seeking asylum. Uh, I don't believe that people should be going to CBP processing centers anymore. I think the federal government has to come up with another solution. 
Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the children could stay anywhere from five to nine days. Some stays could be extended if someone tests positive for COVID-19. The duration of their stay will vary, but the goal is to get the children reunited with their sponsors and family members here in the U.S. Now, officials say that this facility will be running at least until May. Coming up at 6, we'll bring you the latest details. Reporting from Freeman Coliseum, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, Tiffany. Also coming up tonight at 6, we'll be speaking with County Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores about her visit to the Coliseum today and her push for more COVID-19 vaccine sites. That's coming up during our KSAT Q&A tonight around 6.30. A new at five, a man who's considered a person of interest in the 2018 murder of a 20 year old girl back in police custody on unrelated charges. Alexander Joshua Mickelson was arrested in Las Vegas, extradited to Bear County earlier this month. He's facing sexual assault charges for two incidents in 2015 and 2017. While the two new charges are not related to the death of Mia Lutzenberger, who was found stabbed to death at a jogging trail in October of 2018. The police department tells us Mickelson is still considered a person of interest. We have learned the name of a woman killed at a crash early yesterday morning. She's been identified as 26 year old Lauren Contreras. Investigators say she was speeding along Loop 1604 when she missed a curve there in the road and drove off the highway between Hebner and Bitters. The Contreras hit a concrete barrier, was not wearing a seatbelt. She was thrown from the vehicle and died at the scene. An underage woman facing intoxication manslaughter charges for a T-bone crash that killed two people and injured four children back in January. This happened along Highway 16 in Holotus. According to arrest records, the suspect, Elena Carranza, had been drinking at a bar on the Riverwalk and had her last drink about 90 minutes before this crash. She told officers she'd been drinking earlier in the day. A blood draw later revealed her blood alcohol level was one and a half times the legal limit. 54-year-old Craig Smith and his 39-year-old wife Susan died in this crash. Their four children all suffered injuries, one a traumatic brain injury. Texas, of course, prohibits the sale of alcohol to anyone under the age of 21. It's unclear whether the bar or the bartender in this case could be held accountable. A man facing charges after leading sheriff's deputies on a chase this morning. It started at a gas station near Highway 90 in Montgomery. The deputies went to question the suspect after someone reported he was selling a 16 year old girl's clothes from out of his vehicle. The man drove off, hit two vehicles during the chase, came to a stop about seven miles away along Loop 1604 in Petranco. BCSO says he had active warrants out for his arrest. It is day two in the trial of the ex Minneapolis police officer accused of killing George Floyd. Derek Chauvin facing murder charges in Floyd's death. As ABC's Rena Roy reports today, more witnesses took the stand, including a young woman who filmed the deadly encounter. Morning again, Witness Williams. Donald Williams back on the stand today, detailing what he saw last Memorial Day when George Floyd died and why he felt he had to call the police on the police. His 911 call played in court. He just pretty much just killed this guy that wasn't resisting arrest. The trained MMA fighter saying former police officer Derek Chauvin carried out a deadly move called a blood choke with his knee. I believe I witnessed a murder. The defense cross-examining him, describing his yelling heard on that video that sparked protests around the world. Chauvin's attorney claiming bystanders distracted officers in those tense moments. It's fair to say that you grew angrier and angrier. No, I grew professional and professional. I stayed in my body. You can't pay me out to be angry. The 18 year old who recorded that viral video of Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck saying the crowds were not disruptive. Mm -hmm. Her face hidden because she was a minor at the time. Did you see any of the bystanders that act in any way that you would describe as unruly? No. She says what she saw happening to Floyd didn't feel right. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more and not physically interacting and not saving his life, but it's like, it's not what I should have done. It's what he should have done. And moving forward, we're likely to hear from Chauvin's former law enforcement colleagues, including the police chief who's expected to condemn his use of force. In Minneapolis, Rena Roy, ABC News.
The Texas Department of Health and Human Services has launched a website to help people schedule appointments to get the COVID vaccine. Once you register, you'll be notified by email or text with information on when and where to get the vaccine. We have a link to that registry on ksat.com. You, if you don't have internet access, you can call the number you see here on your screen, 833-832-7067 between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. to get help signing up. And of course, as of Monday, Texas opened up vaccine eligibility to anyone over 16 and more states seem to be doing the same. The age expansions come as top health officials remind people to continue taking precautions to help avoid a fourth surge. ABC's Elizabeth Schultze with the details. With coronavirus cases on the rise in nearly half the country, the race to vaccinate is now even more urgent. The CDC reports more than 52 million Americans are fully vaccinated. 12 more states this week making the vaccine eligible to anyone over age 16. At least 90% of all adults in this country will be eligibly vaccinated by April the 19th. The life-saving shots can't come soon enough, with the death toll in the U.S. now exceeding 550,000. After several weeks of declines, COVID infections are rising again. The U.S. averaging more than 60,000 new cases a day. The director of the CDC pointing to loosening restrictions, increased travel, and new variants, making this plea for Americans to follow health guidelines. While we have so much hope on the horizon, we are just asking you to hang on a just a little bit longer. And today, a report by the World Health Organization and China finds the virus likely originated in bats and was transmitted through animals to humans. The report saying it's extremely unlikely COVID-19 came from an accidental lab leak in China, but not ruling out the possibility. We've only scratched the surface of this very complex uh, set of studies that need to be conducted. In a joint statement, the U.S. and 13 other countries expressed concern about the WHO report, not explicitly criticizing the Chinese government, but saying the process lacked transparency. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. At a time when we're all experiencing some of the biggest challenges of our lifetimes, it can be even harder to navigate when you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant in a pandemic. From vaccine concerns to delivery methods, we've been receiving so many questions from viewers all month long. And tomorrow, our Courtney Freeman will be delivering them to a panel of experts during our pregnancy and infertility town hall. We've seen 10,000 plus women be who are pregnant, been immunized with the Pfizer Moderna vaccines at this point and have not seen any significant pregnancy complications related to it. Dr. Patrick Ramsey with University Health, just one of the experts we'll be speaking with. Join us for our pregnancy and infertility in a pandemic town hall tomorrow at 2 o'clock. You can stream the event on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app, however you stream. And today, a lot of cloud cover out there, but still a warm day, relatively speaking. We started at 61, made it up to 80 degrees, and that's our current reading at the airport right now. Even Del Rio, 86, 74, though. Leon Springs, 81 right now, currently in Shirts and Floresville. Floresville checking in at 82 degrees. So for the most part, we're hovering right around the 80 degree mark, give or take a few degrees. As we go through the evening, you don't need a jacket. It's actually pretty comfortable. Temperatures mostly in the 70s. Some noticeable humidity out there, but it's not oppressive. And tonight, no big changes. Actually, a relatively warm night, but a strong cold front hits us tomorrow. We're talking wind, big temperature drop, and even some rain chances. More details on that coming up, Myra. All right, thanks, Adam. It is that time of year again. Property valuations going out this week, and you might be surprised by the results. What to expect up next. If you thought the pandemic would put a damper on your home or property values, not so. Beginning Thursday, the Bear Appraisal District will post and mail new valuations. And for most everyone, they're higher. So unless the tax rates change, that means higher property taxes. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moore. It's on why and what you can do about it. Denver Heights, a modest neighborhood where home values have gone through the roof. In just four years, Elsie Guzman says more than doubled. My husband is 100% disabled, so our taxes doesn't go up as much. But other people, I 
I feel sorry for. They're about to see it again. Almost all Bear County homeowners will get notice this week of their new appraisals up an average 6.9% despite a year long pandemic shutdowns and economic upheaval. How can that happen? Pandemic or no pandemic, there is a market that's active and our job is, is to follow the market and to try to reflect what the market is doing in each and every neighborhood. Chief Appraiser Mike Amiskita thought values would cool off this year. Instead, the home buying market was hot. A lot of the areas that we're seeing the largest increases are in some of the poorest communities or the more affordable communities of San Antonio. Older neighborhoods like Elsie seeing new development. We like living in a historic district. Like Lavaca, where Michael White just moved into this renovated bungalow built in 1900. He doesn't mind knowing his investment is is about to be worth more. We anticipated the property values would probably be going up, um, so we definitely uh, took that into account when we made this purchase. If you disagree with your valuation, you can, of course, protest. They're expecting a record number of those. By the way, last year, 94% of people who did protest reached a settlement. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's take a live look with live cam. 81 degrees, but you can certainly feel the humidity mm -hmm. today. It's back. Yeah, but it's back just for today. We have some big changes coming tomorrow as a cold front hits us. And this is the type of cold front that kind of slaps you in the face a little bit when it arrives. So windy and much cooler tomorrow. Jacket weather. I mean, most of the day you'll need a jacket and even a few light showers. So we're going to talk about the wind, then we'll get to rain chances, and then we'll talk about the temperature change. Let's start with the wind because we think that's going to be the main headline tomorrow. Right now it's out of the south southeast, about 15 miles per hour. You head farther to the west along the Rio Grande, and it's uh, not quite as strong, closer to 10 miles per hour. But let's go through time here with our future cast. And notice by 7 a.m. in the morning, early risers not noticing anything. You're not going to notice anything different around sunrise. In the hill country, you'll start to notice it. But here in San Antonio, no, no big changes even at 7 a.m. But just a few hours thereafter, we're talking 9, 10 a.m., boom, the big wind from the north picks up. We're talking steady winds out of the north at 25 miles per hour. Okay, so a sustained wind around 25 and then gusting at times, I think up to 45 miles per hour. This particular computer model is indicating some wind gusts up to about 35, 36 miles per hour. We're thinking it's probably gonna be about 10 miles per hour more than that. So a windy day tomorrow, that is the big headline with the north wind. Let's talk about rain chances. You look at the cold front, it's draped across north Texas and goes up through the plains. Not a whole lot of activity along that cold front. You know, sometimes these fronts can really get things going and trigger some showers. This one's not gonna have a lot of action here in Texas. Behind it, I do think we'll have some spotty light showers tomorrow, but not much in terms of accumulations or coverage. Here's our future cast. Clouds, they really fill in tonight and early tomorrow morning. So look at 6 a.m. The cold front's moving into the hill country. A few showers along it. Maybe a thin, broken line of light rain. 9, 10 a.m. here in San Antonio as the cold front hits. But behind it, we still have the chance of a few little hit or miss showers into the midday and even afternoon hours, especially south of Highway 90. Again, we don't anticipate much in terms of accumulations or even even coverage, but a little bit of dampness here and there through about mid to late afternoon. And then the sky's going to clear out again by sunset tomorrow. All right, so we've got the wind. It's going to be a gusty day tomorrow and even a little bit of rain, but you're probably not going to need your umbrella much. Let's talk temperatures. 80 now, dew point is 64. So we're a little above average now and you actually feel the humidity. The humidity is going to get swept away as our temperatures drop. Right now, most of us near 80, 81 New Braunfels, 79 Carrizo Springs, 74 though in Kerrville, a little bit cooler in the hill country, but they're not at the cold front yet. The cold front off in North Texas, we're talking 50s and 60s up in the panhandle and even colder as you head farther north up the plains. So that cooler air is going to spill into town. This evening and tonight, you're not going to feel it. Mostly in the 70s, even through midnight, upper 60s. So you don't really need a jacket tonight. It's tomorrow by 9, 10 a.m. That's when the temperature drops. We go from the upper 60s down into the 50s, and we're going to spend a good portion of the midday in the 50s and then briefly make it up into the lower 60s for a high temperature. And then nothing to worry about. Thursday, Friday, sunny, upper 60s, and then some clouds greet us this weekend, but unlikely for rain chances.
All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. Home is supposed to be where the winds are. <laughs> but the Spurs are not enjoying a home court advantage this year. Not at all. And you know the good thing about this, after this home stand, most of their games remaining will be on the road where they're much better. Maybe that's good. <laughs> Who's, yeah. Who knows why? When we come back, how the Sacramento Kings are now home wreckers for the Spurs. And was Baylor robbed? You be the judge coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs have struggled in their longest homestand in franchise history, winning only one game of the first five, and that was Saturday night against Chicago. Last night against the Kings, they were doing well until they fell apart in the second and fourth quarters. That's after the silver and black got out to a hot start here. Jakob Pertl, who led the Spurs at 20 points against Chicago and 11 in the first quarter alone, put the Spurs up 26 to 20. And then DeJounte Murray scored 21 of his 23 points in the first half to lead 31-27 at the end of the first quarter. And then the Spurs were outscored 41 to 29 in the second quarter behind Aaron Fox's 24 points. Derek White's defense helps tie the game at 60 as he pokes the ball away, takes it the other way for the basket. But the Kings go on an 8-0 run to close out the first half, including Buddy Hill's 27-foot three-pointer, one of five on the night to lead 68-60 at the half. The Spurs would be down 19 in third quarter until they start to come back behind Rudy Gay's jumper. Pulls the Spurs within six going into the fourth and final quarter. That's when the Spurs were outscored 35-24, even though Drew Eubanks' basket got the Spurs within three, 104-101. Kings pull away with three-point shooting Maurice Harkless, one of the Kings' 18 three-pointers on the night in the 132-115 victory. The Spurs are now 1-4 and four in this home stand and have now dropped to 8th in the Western Conference playoff picture. They definitely shot it well, but, I mean, we kind of gave them a lot of good looks, too, so it's kind of both of us, and um, we got to be better defensively. And I mean, obviously, they were hot today, but we still got to be better. All right, next up for the Spurs, a quick rematch with Sacramento tomorrow night at 7.30. There is no question about it. The Baylor Bears are robbed in the closing seconds of their hard-fought battle against number one seed UConn in the regional finals of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament being held in the Alamo Dome. With Baylor down 68-67, the Bear DeJounte Carrington tried to curl around the left side, and when she went up, everyone was expecting a whistle, but no call. That's right, no call, even though she's clearly fouled by not one but two UConn players with four seconds left. Even LeBron James tweeted before he was watching the Again, that was a foul. In fact, the shot never reached the rim as she falls backwards as well as the shot at the upset. UConn advances to the final four, 69-67. And I personally don't see it as a controversial call. I've already seen the replay and one girl fouled me in my face and one girl, girl fouled me on my arm. So at that point, you can't do anything else. We drew up a play. Liz got fouled posting up and I got fouled driving. So nothing we could really do about that situation in particular. But, you know. Turn the page. All right. For the Baylor men, they are headed to the Final Four for the first time in 71 years. Got that story coming up for you at six. Two of the Final Four from the state of Texas. That's right. Old Southwest Conference foes, too. Remember? There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. That is all our time. Thanks so much for watching the News at 5. World News is up next. We'll see you right back here at 6 o'clock.